Good morning. I am Paul. We are so thrilled and delighted to have you here with us, especially because for many years we've wanted you to come to the Freedom Forum. And we invited you, and due to a series of circumstances, you couldn't come. And eventually, the year you might have come, you were kidnapped. But be before we talk about the kidnapping and the transnational repression of the regime of Paul Kagame, I wanted to ask a few questions about the Rwandan genocide. So, uh, in 1994, one of the worst genocides of the 20th century occurred in Rwanda, where somewhere between 800,000 and a million people uh, were killed, 15% of the population, in about 90 days. You were the manager of the Hotel de Mille Collines, where you saved the lives of 1,268 people, a mixture of both Hutus and, and Tutsis. Um, how did you manage to keep the hotel as a safe haven for these people? Thank you for this exciting question. Actually, in 1994 was more or less a war. And the best weapon I had to use at that time was my word. I will tell you that the best and the worst weapon in a human being's life is always a word, depending on how we use it. So you were able to talk your way into protecting these people? Yes, I was always negotiating. Sometimes I would even offer a drink. We call it a drink in Kenya Rwanda. We do not say drinks, but we call it just a drink. As in Kenya Rwanda, we do not drink, we test. What were some of the most difficult decisions you had to make when you were manager of that hotel? Well, as a manager in such circumstances, I had to make many complicated decisions. The hotel was attacked many times. Ex an example was on April 23rd, when I was asked by the army guys who had been sent to get all of us out. I had to, it was at 6 a.m. in the morning, it was midnight in Washington, D.C. It was six in Paris and Brussels. So it was a very bad time to attack a hotel. So I had friends. I had contacts. I had then to use all of those contacts. It took a few minutes to get everybody safe. How did the experience as a manager of that hotel and both what was occurring inside the hotel and what you knew was happening on the outside with all of this butchery and all of this killing, uh, most of these people killed with machetes, um, how, how did these experiences affect you personally and emotionally? The, 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 let's say the, those experiences I went through each and every hour, each and every minute, was, um, was a, a time to, the, to, to kill each and every one in the hotel. So that told me, that taught me that I was, I had to be, I had to be always awake, 24 hours a day and uh, seven days a week. From the beginning to the end, I was always very keen, always I was always moving around. And of course, sometimes I would get some information from of what is supposed to be happening in a few minutes from outside. Did you, um, did, do you think, what are the lessons that we can learn, those of us from outside of Rwanda, about the experience of the Rwandan genocide? What is, for, for you, there must be many lessons that you think the world should know. What is, what, if we, we could number a few of those, what, what are the things you think the world should know? One of the most important lessons I think that the world should learn is that when the Rwandan genocide was taking place, the world pretended to close eyes and ears 
and pretended not to see what was going on. And in the end, we saw everybody coming to Rwanda, just on his or her knees, now, now apologizing, saying we are sorry. We are sorry of what happened to you. We would have done this and that. But unfortunately, we should learn that history keeps repeating itself and does not teach us any lessons. The, what happens to Rwandans happened to Jewish people in order during World War II. And then it was the, the, the lesson was never again. This happened in Rwanda. This is still happening to, in Rwanda. Does never again mean never again. Well, that was the idea behind the United Nations. The concept was never again. Yes. Which actually, given that you've begun, let me go into a little controversial area here. The United Nations was set up to prevent genocides. And yet we have seen the world go through multiple genocides since the setup of the UN. Um, revealing, of course, that it has proven that it is not very effective at stopping genocide. But there have been, uh, there's some research that indicates that the UN was involved in the genocide in as much as the weapons that were sold to the government of Rwanda that carried out the genocide, both the machetes and the bullets, came from two countries, China and Egypt. And the negotiation for the arms deal involved the Secretary General of the United Nations. And the, uh, the financing of that arms deal was provided by the World Bank. What is your opinion about this research that has come out recently about the UN's involvement in the arming of Rwanda? I would not say that the United Nations were involved in, the, in doing the genocide. But rather, I would say that the United Nations did not do what they were supposed to do, to save lives. The UN had 2,700 soldiers in Rwanda in 1994 on April 6th when the Rwandan president and the Burundese president were assassinated, when they were killed and the genocide broke out. And the, the following morning, on, this, on uh, April 7th, the, 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 the Rwandan army, the then Rwandan army, happened to kill 10 of the UN army guys. And immediately that same day, the United Nations decided to pull out from Rwanda. That is, that is then when the United decided to pull out from Rwanda, that is when the UN military guys were now were taken outside and taken out. And they left only 250 or 70 soldiers. What the, the, the mistake the UN made was to pretend to be there to have a UN general leading 200 soldiers. That was the mistake, the biggest mistake that the UN did. And that the mission, the UN mission now remained just m m running around and just taking dead bodies or those injured, taking them to hospitals, and that was it. So they didn't stop any of the killing? No. Now, I, I, I want to accelerate, if I can. You went into exile in 1996, self-imposed exile um, from Rwanda uh, because of your disagreements with and your criticism of the man who was the dictator then, back in 1996, who actually is the dictator still in 2024. You went into exile. Um, you continued your activism. And let's talk about your kidnapping in the year 2020. A bishop, a pastor of a church in Burundi, invited you to leave Texas and travel to Burundi to give a talk. They, you flew uh, in a commercial airliner to um, the United Arab Emirates, uh, which I should indicate, of course, is a dictatorship. And there you boarded a private plane that was supposed to take you to Burundi. But in fact, the private plane had been hired by the dictator of Rwanda to take you, kidnap you, and take you back to Rwanda. You were put in prison in Rwanda. What happened then? Did the dictator come and visit you? 
Well, I was um, initially, I was not directly taken to prison. I was taken to a place they call the safe house. They call it safe, why? Because they are the only ones who know those houses and what they do in the house and in those houses, how they do torture and kill people. And then I was also tortured. I was tied from the back, my legs tied, my head in a pocket, and I'm in a bag, in a bag, locked, beaten with the quarter feet, legs, everything, tortured. And then I taken at a given time, I was also taken to prison. So the man who invited me called himself the man of God, the bishop, the, 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 the apostle, he called him Nenemit. He pretended to be from Burundi, and yet he was not from Burundi, he was from Rwanda. They, um, they wanted to send a message, not just revenge against you for your ongoing criticism of Paul Kagame a dictator that has been so good at uh, paying people in the West, hiring lobbyists, paying off former senators, congressmen, members of parliament in European countries to tell everyone about how good he is at everything and that he's not a dictator and brought peace to the country. But you were a voice and because you are probably the most well-known Rwandan outside of the dictator, uh, he wanted to send a message to everyone else, didn't he? That if, 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 you can crit if you criticize me, you could be living in Texas. I will get you. I will bring you back. I will punish you. This, uh, the, this is what they call transnational repression. Rwanda, the Rwandan government has been doing this for many years. Since in 2013, they killed a uh, colonel who used to be a chief of intelligence for President Kagame in South Africa. They killed the Rwandan former Minister of Home Affairs in Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. They just um, killed many other guys all over, all over the world. So the kidnapping people to Kagame, threatening each and everyone, is a part of his mission. That is, um, it has become a profession. So I was not surprised to be kidnapped because Kagame does this to each and everyone who stands up and says what Kagame does not want to be said about him. So I asked you when, when we were backstage just before we, we, we came on, and this is why I wanted you to go into this, if he ever came to gloat that he had taken you. And you said that he didn't come, but he sent people. And then what you said to me just now a few minutes ago uh, bears repeating. What happened when the prosecutor general and his right-hand man came to see you? What did they say? Actually, Kagame didn't, want, didn't come to see me personally in prison, where I was. But he sent two people. One of them was the prosecutor general of the Rwandan, of the Rwandan government. Emable Havogiarimye, that is his name. And uh, another one was Ruhungaja No, who was the Secretary General of, the, of RIB. RIB is Rwanda Investigation Bureau. They came to me and told me that, listen, Mr. Sesabagina, you are not going to stay in this prison forever. But it is up to you. Tell us how you come to meet all of those foreign politicians. And tell us, all of them, give us even their names. What you have been discussing with them, and it will be a matter of time. If you tell us that, you, do you want to be a minister? After that, you will be a minister. Do you want to be ambassador? Choose a country. Do you want to be a prime minister? Choose. You can be one. The only position you cannot get is to be the president of this country because you know Mr. Kagame is still there. I, in, I indirectly said no because I told them that, listen, thank you for the message. I am going to think about it. That was a kind of no. Then they went out and this was it. But, but it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, just consider for a moment uh, the fear that this government has, 
that a critic from the outside is so dangerous because he's a lone independent voice. You don't have a, an organization, you don't have a big foundation, you don't have a massive voice, you have your experience and your integrity. And their view is, let's, let's take him, how do we silence him? We may not be able to kill him. Maybe we can poison him, maybe he can die in prison of natural causes. Let's offer him to be an ambassador. Because in their minds, that's what you want. In their minds, it's power that is the only thing that people seek. Yep. And so they offered you this thinking this is something that you would want or take. It, it, it really is so extraordinary. It's such an incredible story. Now, you were, you were released uh, from prison after a massive international campaign and the involvement of you know, the, the, the White House and multiple administrations and people who, who, who negotiated to get you out. Um, you're continuing the work that you're doing. Now, uh, I would love to continue this. We, the Human Rights Foundation, by the way, has a, a set of podcasts. One of them um, is about dictatorships, and we're going to have you on that podcast where we can have a, a two or three hour conversation uh, because there's so many subjects to cover. Unfortunately, we're limited on time. So I want to ask you two final questions. The first one is, do you consider yourself a hero? Well, many people have asked me this question. And uh, this is why, if you happen to read my autobiography, which came out on April 6, 2006, the title is very simple, An Ordinary Man. An ordinary man. Yeah. Now, who are your heroes? My father. Tell us about your father. My father was also an ordinary man who would call us, all, all of us, his children, wherever we used to be, outside, home, grown ups. He would always slaughter a beef for us and on the New Year's Eve, all of us, we were traveling home. And we would, he would prepare everything, including drinks, and we would celebrate. Towards the end of the ceremonies, that is when dad would give us a lesson. One of the best lessons that my father gave to, used to give to us was that, listen, my children. If you see two brothers or sisters fighting and you are called upon to come and separate them, you just come. You stand in the middle. Do not make a mistake of looking to your left hand side because that eye of your, on your left hand side is trying, is when it wants to corrupt your decision. Do not make a mistake to look, of looking to your right hand side because that one also is looking for an opportunity to corrupt your decision. You stand in the middle, look up and say the truth and only the truth. That Paul. is one of the lessons I learned from my father. Paul Rusesa Pagina, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.